Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Journey of Integral Recovery podcast. Uh, this week, we have a guest uh, piping in from Cape Town, South Africa, our good friend in uh, recovery, in integral recovery, Guy Duplessis. I want to welcome you, Guy Duplessis. I'm going to introduce you in more detail in a moment. Just, it's wonderful to have you here. We have Doug Prater and I, uh, Bob Weathers, as co-hosts for now. John Dupuy will be joining us uh, uh, in about a half hour. He's involved today in the Spiritual Technology Summit online and, and will be joining us um, as soon as he's able to. Um, Guy, I've known you and adored you for four or five years now, came in contact with you. In fact, I met you before I met John Dupuy, and uh, you're the one that introduced the two of us together. And we've met once at John's house. We're in regular contact. Um, uh, Regular means almost weekly contact over all these years, and you've become a dear friend of mine, Guy. I really, really value you deeply. Uh, Guy brings uh, intellectual uh, depth to the field of recovery and integral recovery, uh, particularly that um, really roots him in the academic traditions, and I'm really very respectful uh, of that as well as your own heartfelt uh, uh, commitment and openness around your own recovery. You've inspired me to be uh, less ashamed of being out with my own recovery, and I'm appreciative for that. And we've been through thick and thin together, and I'm really, really grateful for you, Guy. Um, you're one of the pillars of my life. I'm really grateful for that. It's a real honor, privilege to have you here. Guy has written um, uh, a lot in the field of integral recovery. Uh, uh, numerous articles uh, uh, of a more academic vein in uh, various integral uh, journals, uh, presentations at conferences. We had the chance to co-present at one conference, a recent integral uh, theory conference. I was really uh, honored to be able to join you in that at a distance. Guy has also published one of the first two books in integral recovery, A Guide to Integral Recovery, 12 Steps and Beyond, which I highly recommend on Integral Press. Guy is also instrumental in publishing a book on the mind body, a, a book on a workbook on treating addictions. That uh, he's one of the co-authors and and uh, uh, and I've worked together in that whole domain of mind body work, um, uh, following on Stan Block's pioneering work. So I'm really grateful for that connection. I also know the guy. You've got another book coming out. Uh, last time that we spoke, it might be coming out even in early summer, which is a. Uh, uh, another book on integral recovery and I, 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 I reviewed this book and I'm really looking forward to it coming out and it's um, it's as much of an academic kind of digging into integral recovery as it is a practical or clinical volume. I think your previous book was more along those ideas uh, along those lines and so uh, uh, really looking forward to that as a complementary piece there's overlap but they're not redundant and really looking forward to that I think it's in that spirit guide that, uh, that we've invited you here I was particularly taken in my review of your, your book right now that's uh, moving towards being published, very taken by the depth of your analysis of, I'm gonna say upper left-hand quadrant realities without wanting to be reductionistic here, looking at existential and phenomenological perspectives on addiction and recovery, and was uh, personally really moved by, by uh, pieces that you discussed there. And, I have invited you to join us today. This is right on the heels of guys coming back from a, 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 a study stint at uh, really the premier university on the planet for the study of phenomenology, the University of Leuf in, in Belgium. And uh, Guy, you and I were in contact while you were there. This houses the library of the founder of modern phenomenological philosophy and psychology, Edmund Husserl. And uh, you got, to, got a chance to experience that firsthand. And it deepens your studies, I know, as you work right now towards your doctorate and your doctoral dissertation, which itself will be in this domain as well. So Guy brings a kind of pedigree to the conversation on integral recovery that's really unparalleled in this field. And we're just really honored and pleased to have you here with us today, Guy. So welcome to you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Bob, for such a generous introduction. Uh, it's hard to uh, <laughs> very, very pleased to be here. Thank you. Yeah, the introduction <laughs> is well deserved, my friend. Guy and I talked about this, and, and Doug, you'll be joining in, as well as uh, John, to introduce maybe what, what, is, what is an existential or phenomenological perspective? Uh, what is that to begin with, and how might that pertain to addiction? And maybe we can open into kind of following a flow through, how do we understand addiction from, from this perspective? What, is, how, what value does it lend? 
and how does it pertain to treatment and the recovery process? And let's just kind of follow this organically and see how it unfolds, okay? Yeah. So Guy, I'd invite you just to share some beginning salvos here with us if you don't mind. Sure. Um, well, maybe to, to contextualize um, what, what you mentioned, a sort of existential or existential phenomenological perspective of addiction, um, to contextualize that within the tradition of existentialism <clears throat> or existential philosophy rather um, and phenomenology. Um, I think it's quite tricky, I think, for anybody to give a definition of what existentialism is or what existential philosophy is for that matter, because the philosophers that are grouped under that category are so are so diverse. I mean, you have Kierkegaard, that's a, a religious thinker, and then you have Nietzsche that, that is sort of known for not being that religious. Um, and uh, Sartre and uh, sort of Heidegger and all these different um, type of characters that quite different philosophies, but I think what all of them had in common was a concern for um, the, our human being in the world. Like, what, what is the purpose? How do, how do we, are, are, you know, how are we to be in a way? Um, how should we act? I think it's got a sort of moral component as well. Um, so I think a, a simple way maybe to explain existential philosophy or existentialism, which is mostly related to Sartre, is to say that it's a philosophy that deeply is deeply concerned about <clears throat> the human being in the world. Um, you know, what, what the human concerns are, how they should behave. Um, and then obviously in, in the sort of common, common um, explanation of it is the relation to meaning. So very often when people think of existentialism or existential philosophy, it's related to the question of meaning. What's the meaning of life? Is there meaning? If there is a meaning, um, how do we discover that? And how do we um, align ourselves to that? Um, and then very simply put, phenomenology is sort of the study of, of experience. And the reason I think we brought phenomenology uh, together here is, is the field of existential uh, phenomenology. And that's really, I think the reason they got married in a way is that the, to understand what it means to be human, the best technique to do that is probably the phenomenological technique, which is very simply a sort of first person description of what I myself am experiencing of something. So right now I'm experiencing talking to you and a phenomenological description would be as my experience of speaking to you. Um, so this is sort of a marriage between existential philosophy and, and phenomenology. And phenomenology is more the method that a lot of existential thinkers use to get a better understanding of really what it means to be, to be human. Thank you. That's very, very clarifying. I know it's a, it's a simplification, but we can use that. It's, it's, uh, you know, I can still remember you and I've talked about this. I can still remember opening Heidegger's being in time in graduate school 35 years ago, thinking that I like this guy. I'm just going to dive right in and be completely yeah. <laughs> pulled over by the language. Yeah. No, it's itself is as complicated. And so, yeah. so it can be forbidding. Uh, yeah. Having said that, is that with, 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 with some guidance, for example, Kierkegaard has been extremely meaningful to me and had a number of courses in graduate school on him, and it begins to open him up, the same you could say about Nietzsche or Sartre or, or any of the other great existentialists. And so uh, to, to not be put off by the complexity of it, and I appreciate yeah. you kind of schematizing it so that we can understand it. Guy, now, what, what would you say is a beginning bridge then to... Uh, this domain of addiction and recovery in the context of integral recovery. In fact, I guess I might ask, how would this even fit under the, the umbrella, would you say, of integral recovery? So any yeah. thoughts there? Um, well, well, for me, integral recovery would be a, um, an umbrella term that refers to a very comprehensive approach to recovery that I think to a large extent is, is informed by, by integral theory. And seeing that integral theory is a theory of everything, in um, for like you know as it's often referred to, <clears throat> whether that's the case or not is is, is debatable. But um, 
um, integral recovery tries to be as comprehensive and as in, and inclusive as it can. So it tries to cover all the bases, which which is a very noble task and in some ways impossible. But the the, the yearning is there, the attempt is there, <clears throat> and so for me, integral recovery is this organic movement in a way. Um, which I'm very fortunate to have been a small part of, that is continuously sort of absorbing new technology, what we sometimes refer to sort of recovery technology, <clears throat> which is about not merely um, recovering from addiction or preventing relapse. Normally when we speak about recovery and, and treatment, we speak about treating addiction as if it is something that can be treated. Um, as a disease or something that could be cut out or resolved, which I think is misguided. Um, and then uh, how do we preve prevent from going back into that be behavior? And beyond that, there's not much said about, you know, recovery. And for, for any of us that's been in recovery a while, uh, those two factors fall away after a while. You know, the fact that you want to use drugs might not even be an issue or that you need to do something to prevent the use of drugs. You, you, you're in life now. Yeah. And addicts do have certain, I won't say that they have unique needs, <clears throat> but they've got slightly, one could probably say a bit of a handicap when it comes to facing life on life's terms. So they need a bit of extra guidance, perhaps than the average guy on, on the street for that matter. Yeah. So I think integral recovery for me is, is developing a roadmap um, and not just a roadmap, but also a set of headlights. So it's like a sort of a roadmap and a, and a headlights that illuminate as much of the territory, and not just the first year or second year, but for the next hundred years of what the recovery process would look like. And obviously, eventually, recovery <clears throat> starts blurring into, I mean, somebody that's 20 years clean and doing a lot of things, is there any difference between his life and somebody that, hasn't used drugs for that matter. You know, it, it starts blurring where what, what recovery even is or what the boundary is. Um, so in a way, integral recovery is sort of illuminating the path until it's not even integral recovery anymore. You know, it is, but it's not. If it stays integral recovery, you're sort of still in recovery, but it sort of needs to stop being integral recovery to be integral recovery. Yeah. That makes sense. So, so yeah, it's just a, a big a bigger map and a bigger set of headlights. Appreciate very, appreciate very much, Guy, what you're saying in terms of your, your innovative thinking. And I, I know that you know that I'm very much in sync with you. Doug, I want to invite you to, to share any thoughts that you might have in these first few minutes with, with Guy. Yeah, I think that uh, the epistemological approach of focusing on uh, phenomenology instead of the materialistic domain is an important addition here. And I'm really curious, having not read any of your work, um, how we can, or, or, or what are some of the insights of studying that approach, some of the benefits of taking this particular perspective that uh, we can bring to daily life, not, not only in recovery and integral recovery, but in existence? Well, for me, why, why I find um, uh, sort of existential um, and to lesser degree a phenomenological I mean, firstly, addicts, addicts are the experts on phen the phenomenology of addiction. There's no one that can tell an addict anything. There's no book or, or a, a so-called expert that can tell addicts anything about the phenomenology of drugs because they're the ones that, that experience that. So, um, and, that's, and that voice for me is very often lost in academic literature and also um, <clears throat> recovery literature. I think um, self-help movements like AA and 12-step movements are good with that because really it is, it, if one looks at it, it's really a phenomenological method that, that was based from people's first-person experience of what recovery was before trying to understand, before they realized what they were doing, they were experiencing something and then sort of keeping record of that. Oh, I see this seemed to work, so let's try that again. Um, so I would say AA is is first and foremost the phenomenological method um, of how it actually originated, and then at the same time, the actual working of the program is is very phenomenological. It's not theoretical that there's something to understand. Once you understand it, there's a transformation. Sure, there's a intellectual element, 
but it's experiential and and that experiential is phenomenological um, and the way you share your experience even 12-step meetings are phenomenological because you share your <clears throat> in the the words they use we share our experience we don't share our theories or we don't share the truth or the wisdom we share our experience but um <clears throat> You know, I think maybe just to to sort of clarify what what you know. Now I'm speaking purely from my perspective as well. Yeah, I'm not I'm not speaking from a perspective that I'm trying to clarify what an existential perspective of addiction is, because I think there's there's many and there's many other people that would come from a from a different perspective. But for me, um, using an an existential lens would be is looking at the sort of etiology of addiction on a, why people become addicts and also looking at recovery of what is sustainable recovery mm -hmm. through existential lens. When we I say existential lens, we we'll probably say from existential philosophy and existential psychology as well. And probably mostly from an existential psychology perspective or psychotherapy perspective, which is obviously usually informed by uh, existential philosophers. Um, and that for me would simply be um, using some of the main themes in, in existential psychology within the context of recovery. And maybe one of the main themes would be is how do we deal with existence? And um, <clears throat> Yalom and those guys would say there's, there's a couple of existential givens to existence. All, I think it's dealing with confronting freedom, uh, isolation, uh, meaninglessness and, and death and how we confront these givens <clears throat> and as the existential philosophers wrote a lot about the, the feeling the dread or the angst or the anxiety that this provokes because there's no way out of this um, and the way that we deal with this Heidegger wrote a lot about our confrontation with with death for instance um, which isn't necessarily to be understood as some morbid um, fascination with it you know it's it's a, it's, a, it's a given there's no way out of that um so so how do how do people that deal with that existential givens how does that contribute towards addiction um as an ideological factor and also how do we deal with that um in, in recovery um so that's the one element that i think is one of the core core sort of themes from from that particular approach <clears throat> and then the other element that I, that for me is particularly important and, and and very interesting is the the idea of 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 basic existential needs um, people call the different words fundamental human needs i prefer the the the, the term which some other people use is basic existential needs mm -hmm. and those are seen as ontological in the sense that we're born with these needs they sort of biologically hardwired into us these aren't social constructions these needs are fairly stable <clears throat> i mean they obviously manifest different within a social environment but whether you're pygmy or whether you living in asia or in africa or in america these needs are fairly consistent within within um any you know within the population so the question is is how do we how do we deal with with these you know um, and the the thinking around that is that there's a direct correlation between how many of these needs are satisfied and our sort of quality of of life and obviously to a large extent one can see the social fabric or, or society as as a mechanism that's designed to help people to have needs met and a healthy society would would enable people to have more needs met and an unhealthy society would would enable people to have needs met but maybe through destructive means so why for me why that is important for me in the context of of addiction is i think one of the central themes that as i've been sort of studying various etiological models of addiction <clears throat> it seems to me one of the themes that's present in a lot of them i won't say all of them but in a lot of them is that the idea of a need of how a person attempts to have a need satisfied and that becomes sort of pathological and to some extent there's always some something of that within any 
perspective that you need to look at addiction from. You know, you can look at it from a psychodynamic perspective, you can look at it from a social perspective. It's a psychodynamic perspective. One would say something like, due to poor early relationships, somebody was left with some deficit of the self and he's got a strong object hunger and I is attracted to, to, to drugs to satisfy some archaic need or whatever. Now then, so, once again, Guy, when we talk about these needs, we're talking about the need for connection or the need for meaning or, or, or these type of, of psychological existential needs and not so much survival needs, food and water and that type of thing, but rather fulfillment. Yeah. Yeah, they will, they, will, they will form, most of it is sort of social and relational. And then one of the needs, it also depends which model you use. You know, there's many needs models. You've got sort of Maslow's model. I prefer to use a guy called Max Neff, which is a Chilean economist that developed a, a, needs, a needs model. I think his model called Theory of Human Development or something like that. I speak in a correction. And he identified, if I remember correctly, 11 needs. <clears throat> um, and one of them was subsistence, which is closely related to water, food, safety, et cetera. And most of them were, I can't remember all of them, but it's, you know, stuff like affection, um, meaning, freedom, um, you know, very relational and, and, and psychological. <clears throat> yeah. So you, you, you're correct in what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so in, in, in short, <clears throat> what's interesting for me about that is, is that, um, from so many, you know, look, looking at addiction from so many angles, um, I think it comes quite naturally to say that if one had to give one definition of addiction, you know, risking out of the, the possible 300 definitions that there are, that one could, probably the one that would, <clears throat> would, would cover the most bases would be play is that addiction is seen as a dysfunctional way of having basic existential needs met. Um, now that is that sounds grossly oversimplified, and in a way it is. But at the same time, there's there's a lot of truth in that, and and, and that can be spread very wide over so many different perspectives and and, and models. Doesn't matter which way you you look at that. So from an existential um, <clears throat> point of view, the the idea of existential needs is obviously a central a central component of of that perspective so using that lens is is looking at at this process of how people try to have these needs met um, <clears throat> using addictive means and what that means in recovery and and for me you know i think it's sort of quite common sense in a way you don't need to uh, be an academic to sort of think that. I think a lot of addicts would agree if you, if you had to speak to them and say, do you think that part of your addiction was a way to satisfy some of your needs that would go, yeah, I, I, I probably think so. You know, so. Certainly to cover up anyway, the dread that you mentioned as well. Yeah. As, as well, you know, and, and, <clears throat> you know, and, and all of these, even something like trauma, if somebody had trauma as a child, is it really the trauma that is causing the addiction or is it because the trauma inhibited somebody from having certain needs met that is causing the addiction you know um that's 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 debatable but once again there's there's this idea of of, of needs present guy so, guy let me let me uh, uh interject something here you and i have spoken of this but uh i don't know in the last month or so i sat with a group of, of males a group of uh, men Addicts early in recovery. <laughs> we discuss this. It's funny because I think this conversation uh, predated conversations that you and I have had since then. But <clears throat> it's very much in the spirit of all of our conversations over the years. Is that uh, these are addicts that are primarily introduced to looking at recovery through a traumatic lens. So it's a traumatic etiology, and the resolution of said traumas will lead to the resolution of out the uh, the addiction. And I introduced a different perspective, looking at things less from the past and looking towards the future. So we were fiddling with the idea of time. And <clears throat> what would it be like to uh, turn our gaze rather th than from the past towards the future? And it posited it explicitly in terms of meaning. And <clears throat> it's funny because I was introducing some Greek terminology and this and that. And on the one hand, I was risking being too uh, abstract or whatever. 
the response was so favorable, it suggested to me that it wasn't all that abstract, is that like you were saying earlier, every client in there could identify that there was some part of their fate, we talked about it in terms of fate or destiny, people had different terminology for it. Some people were religious, so they put it as kind of got God's plan for their life or what, something like that. But every uh, individual in that group, it was a group of a dozen men, was able to identify how their addiction was uh, not only impacted, uh, not only impacted their 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 so-called destiny, but itself was impacted by uh, ambivalence about that destiny. There was the people universally were able to say, "I don't think I was born to be a heroin addict. I think I was born for this or born for that." And it just I was what I was struck by was the fruit that came from just opening into what in this context we might call an existential perspective. I was really looking at it as just. Can we look at meaning in the context of addiction? Can we look at the at meaning in the context of whatever recovery might look like? And there was like universal attraction to that topic. We've, we've since followed it up with a number of conversations, but to, to, to bring in the kind of this conversation alongside the more typical psychological frame that in some form or another is gonna be rooted in, in a kind of a traumatic perspective. We even talked about it in terms of looking at addiction as initiation as a form of initiation, uh, that that can be a useful metaphor for looking at this as much as looking at addiction as being traumatic itself. So anyway, just kind of in the spirit of this, it's very pleased by the openness and the universality of the response. It wasn't like some heavy intellectual conversations, exceedingly meaningful and emotional for the people. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And as you say, though, the, um, you know, I also, like making a distinction between substance use and addiction and yeah. i know within dsm5 there isn't nearly no distinction you know it's, it's substance use disorder so it's from very mild use to hardcore addiction is seen as a continuum and i think although that's useful in in some contexts i, th I think that's very problematic mm -hmm. because addiction for me is a very different thing to the idea of somebody using drugs and 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 the idea of substance use has got a moral connection and it's you know whether it's legal or not it's got all these all these um connections that is actually very very little relevance to whether somebody is an addict or not you know whether it's legal or not legal you know um so so the looking at looking at addiction um <clears throat> from 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 the needs perspective there can be many reasons why somebody initiates the use of drugs yeah. and there's a very interesting book i think it's called ritual i can't remember now but a guy called zoja that was the whole book was about really initiation and ritual and, and addiction yes. the whole thing was about what what you mentioned there and i think for a lot of people that go through that that use substances that 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 plays a huge role it's the need the need for initiation the need for ritual gets satisfied through substance use that's why there's so much ritual elements in 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 drugs and drug para paraphernalia the book is called drugs addiction and initiation the That's modern right. search for rich book. book you were yeah. the one that turned me on to it i love that book thank yeah. you Great book. yeah um but the question is why does somebody become addicted and why does other people why you know don't some of the other people that also use drugs for similar reasons um now, I would I would say from a from a needs perspective is that it, that there's something that happens there's something that happens in the mind and body <clears throat> that starts associating the drug with a certain need. Um, so when the person has a, a need for let's say um, intimacy or uh, company, you know, just social connection, um, where if 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 a person's not an addict, there would be a craving <clears throat> for this. You would feel lonely. And you would feel, man, yeah, maybe I should phone a friend or do this, whatever. There's a craving, and then there's a response. Uh, for somebody that starts forming association between heroin and loneliness, when he feels lonely, there isn't necessarily a craving to phone a buddy. It's a craving, but that craving sort of gets sort of channeled towards heroin, and then the craving is just, I feel like heroin. Right. But the reality is, the craving isn't necessarily just for the psychoactive effect of heroin. There, there might be an under, underlying motive and i'm not saying there aren't purely psych you know cravings for drugs as well drugs are also very pleasurable so mm -hmm. cravings can be purely just for the effect but i think what distinguishes addicts from substance users is this sort of pathological relationship with that craving 
Mm. And how that drug became um, <clears throat> a sort of substitute for very basic human needs. Um, and seeing that these needs have to be fulfilled continuously, there, there will be this continuous craving for the drug and eventually um, uh, an addiction to the drug. And what, what the drug eventually does, or addictive behavior, it also inhibits the person's capacity to, to have other needs met. Like if you use heroin for one reason, or one or two, after a couple of months or a couple of years, the lifestyle that you live <clears throat> is going to affect your capacity to have a whole array of needs met because this is such an all-consuming thing. And eventually, the, the, the only way you can have you know, a whole, a whole um, <clears throat> range of needs met is only through the substance. Yeah. You know? It yeah. might not have started out like that. And I think that's a common theme that, that I think most addicts, from speaking about from a phenomenological perspective, would relate to phenomenologically that they that just from a common sense point of view, <clears throat> that that would make make sense to them. Yeah, that's um, great, uh, Guy. I want to I want to uh, introduce John Dupuy has just joined us. Welcome back from Spiritual Technology Summit, John. Now, now, now who is this guy here? <laughs> he he talks funny. Uh, hi, hey. Guy. Anyway, <laughs> okay, we've been uh, great friends for a long time. It seems now. And I remember one time, Guy, you were visiting us here. Seems like about eight doggy years ago. I mean, you know, the, our lives are so intense. And there's so much in them. But you gave your story up in our meditation room with a group. Of, I guess it was a group of our students we had here at the time. It was incredibly moving. Yeah. And I remember uh, reading one of your books and, and your forward. You know, you talked about your history, but you talked about all the friends that you had yeah. lost who yeah. died of overdoses. I mean, it was just heartbreaking. And yeah. and so, you know, what you're talking about here in the third person, take it back to the first person. I mean, what were you looking for when you were doing heroin and doing drugs? And and how did you break it? And how did you become the man you are today? Which, you know, which is mm -hmm. wise, self-effacing, brilliant, you know, mm -hmm. compassionate. I mean, you know, just guy do plays E, what can I say? An existential phenomenological perspective in the first person. I don't know if you're game on for that guy, but you've been invited. I'll join you. I won't leave you alone in that normal dog. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, to some to some extent, although I'm speaking from a third person, uh, uh, a lot of this is is really first person because it's my own, you know, common sense um, understanding of a lot of these things, a sort of intuitive understanding, and then eventually bringing maybe an academic understanding to that but very few of these things is thought art or the result of any academic pursuit it's really an intuition or common sense and then see well how can we i mean academia is really the the way of obscuring something that could be could have been said very simply um and making it sound highly overly complicated you know so so it all starts with with common sense anyway but um i mean some and this ties in with my own experience of recovery. So what 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 the what the real significance of this is for me is is what this means what this means for recovery. Because if if a, if addiction to some extent can be seen as a misguided attempt to have our basic human needs met or existential needs met, what must recovery be then? You know, um, and if recovery is seen as like Bob was mentioning like addiction is something that needs to be treated, like it's a disease and it needs to be cut out or medicate or whatever, you know, um, or it's like a virus or whatever, then then we're not looking in recovery to have our needs. We're, we're looking at how to fix something pathological. And if we take this addiction away or we fix it or we do whatever, then some other person's going to be fine. You know, they're going to, their problems can be resolved and they can live happily ever after. Um, now, from an existential perspective and a need perspective, that will be misguided because what it's saying is that um, you know, the addiction, it's an issue, and it can be seen as a pathology and it can also be seen as a disease to some extent, but these person's basic needs are gonna continue to exist once they get into recovery. And these needs need to be met through healthy ways. And, and Max Neff calls these healthy ways sort of what he calls satisfiers, singular satisfiers or synergistic satisfiers. Um, and this ties in with, with integral recovery and what, what John is always speaking about practice and, and what do we do. So from this perspective, recovery is very simply defined then is, is a lifestyle 
that, uh, that satisfies <clears throat> our basic human needs in a healthy way that is not yeah. destructive. Yeah. An addiction is simply a lifestyle that satisfies these needs. And do they set, I mean, there's heroin is the most effective need satisfied when it comes to loneliness is better than having hundred of your best friends over. You know what I mean? It, it, mm. it works far better than the real thing. Yeah. It's just a violator because what it did spectacularly in the beginning, it completely destroys towards the end. You know, it's the siren song. Yeah, so yeah. It's not, that, not that the drugs don't work. They actually do a better job than the real thing. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, uh, you go back to like minus, but not just zero. Yeah, so, yeah. It, the, the pain and the suffering begins to just exponentially yeah, just benefit. go out of yeah. control completely. But it, hey, I had, a quest, I had a question yeah. for you, Guy. One of the things I uh, enjoy about your work is that you talk about stages of recovery, you know, and, and, and that's really, and I, I kind of touched on it a little bit, and I talk more about the stages of addiction, but you talk about yeah. the stages of getting well. And, uh, and and the reading of the recent book on, on Ken Wilber, uh, where he was talking about politics and the post-truth era and Trump and all this stuff, he said, he was talking about slavery, you know, and the way out of uh, human beings enslaving other people was not to tell them, oh, you're really bad for having slaves. It was to develop them to the next level of their own development where they go, a slave? I can't do that, you know? And, and I'm thinking with, uh, and I was thinking about your stages of, of, uh, of, of addiction that it's something not to, oh, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, doper, doper, doper. And there was a, there was a school of that kind of treatment in the United States years ago. If I, I think it's faded mainly, hopefully, but is to take these people to the level where that is no longer, their, their needs are getting met, as you said, and that, that controlling subject of we're going to have drugs, yeah. go to her drugs becomes something that is no longer the controlling subject, but an object that has to be dealt with, managed, and it begins to lose its power as we continue to, uh, establishing horizontally and living on this higher level of element and even moving on to other ones if we if we so desire and we're willing to do the work yeah ab ab absolutely and i think what those what those sort of stages refer to is is different stages of our <clears throat> you know e each of these stages have got its own challenges and its own set of needs in a way as well you know it's like you're in grade one in school um, your mathematics is at a certain level and then you can function there. The next year it gets more complicated. You have different needs, you've got different challenges. And, and like you were saying with, with the slavery is that if, if somebody is at a certain, you know, if they six months clean, there's going to be certain things they want and certain things they, they need for recovery to be sustainable. And if those things are, if those things are being provided, you're sort of satisfied and then there's a natural progression to the next to the next phase you don't have to push yourself to the next thing it just it just happens um by itself um because that that human beings have got a natural tendency to sort of develop um so with 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 each of these each of these stages if if one if one can't understand what you need at a certain given time, it's very difficult to, to have those needs met. And one of the problems with, with recovery, and John, you've also written about that a lot, is that there's, there's not a stage perspective in, in the recovery process. It's seen as you're an addict and then you're in recovery. And recovery is sometimes seen as this same thing. You know, you do uh, the step 12, one to 12, one to 12, like over and over and over for the next 50 years. <laughs> And you yeah. do the meetings, phone your sponsor. And sure, those things are fine. It's sort of like there's nothing wrong with brushing your teeth every day for the next 50 years either. But <laughs> there's, more, there's more to it than that. You know, Maybe in your first week of recovery, the only thing you needed to do is brush your teeth and you were like in recovery. And then you start bathing as well and then tying your shoelaces. And then, But after six months, you need to do a bit more than that. So... So those basic sort of 12-step uh, wisdom and, 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 uh, and practices work very well, but it works particularly well for people in early recovery. Mm -hmm. And they're also designed for people in early recovery. Absolutely. Um, but as, as you develop and you have different needs, <clears throat> all these needs manifest in, in different ways, then you need, there's new challenges and you need new tools to navigate this new challenge. You can't use the same tool to fix different different problems especially if it becomes more complicated and more more sophisticated 
You remind, the, me, guy, you remind me of the way that Ken Wilber talks about in the spiritual traditions, they're all pre-developmental theory. In other words, developmental theory is a phenomenon in the last hundred years of, of, of Western psychology, uh, and, and that it sheds light on all the meditative traditions, which are distinctly, uh, they, they had no access to that. It makes me think of this in terms of, as you were talking about AA, and I was imagining the big book. I've been studying the big book here closely recently, and it's, and it's distinctly pre-developmental. It doesn't, it doesn't include a developmental perspective. It ought not to, in terms of its yeah. history, but in order for it to stay relevant and to really be enlivened, it needs to, it needs to include this. I think it's something that, John, that you do in your writing, Guy, it's embedded in the center of your writing. I think it's a real contribution is introducing an integral perspective, not only on addiction, but also an integral perspective, I mean, a developmental perspective on addiction as well as recovery. You both do a fantastic job with that. And I think it's for us to bring that, uh, bring that back out into the communities, whether it's yeah. in spiritual yeah. traditions or in, in the recovery traditions like the 12 steps. Yeah, and I, and I, think, it's, I think it's very limiting um, <clears throat> because if, if one looks at the notion of fellowship, which I think is a, is, a, is a central notion. Well, it's certainly a central notion in the post step tradition. Yes, yes. It's a central notion in, in any recovery process is that recovery needs to be contained within some degree of fellowship, that, that recovery is highly unlikely from a purely first-person perspective. Giving somebody a book, sitting alone in a room, recovering. Almost impossible. Very seldom works, you know. Yeah. Um, almost impossible. So there has to be a relational element. And even if there's two people, it's still a fellowship. It's relational. And, and the bigger the fellowship, the bigger the community is, the more, you know, the more powerful it is and the more chance there is that, that the person's going to get better. Um, <clears throat> so the problem for me with seeing recovery in, in the typical way is that your fellowship only stays addicts. You know, it's like yeah. in a path of fellowship. And, and that's where it stays. You're in a fellowship. And, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. You can probably meet all the people you ever need to meet within the 12 steps if you, you, know, if you, if you want. And a lot of people <clears throat> are very happy in that community and, and very seldom join other communities for the rest of their lives. And, you know, good, good for them. But for some other people, they need something else as well. Um, so for me, looking at, looking at um, recovery from a stage perspective, you know, you can look at it from any perspective, from a stage perspective, but one of them would be fellowship. Is initially your fellowship is, is very small and is very sort of uh, ethnocentric in a way that your fellowship are just people like you, you know, mm -hmm. and those are addicts. <clears throat> and in the beginning, it might just be your own addicts. You know, you don't even mix with Coke addicts because they're idiots. Right. You know, you mix with your own addicts. <laughs> and then, yeah, right. <laughs> those, are, those, those pot smokers or those heroin addicts, yeah, you know, we're, like, we're the true AA. We're alcoholics. woo -hoo. <laughs> Right, exactly. Yeah. And, and There's more than a whole truth to that. Oh, no, man. I know it. I've seen it. It's yeah, and, and initially that's very useful because it gives people something to connect to, you know. But, but um, from a developmental perspective, what was useful to you in grade one might not be that useful to you in grade 10 in the same way with a kid. You know, what, what is normal behavior for a three-year-old, if a 30-year-old displays that behavior, it's, it's probably frowned upon, you know, and, yeah. and that is why we intuitively know that because we, we, we understand that developmentally. But if you don't understand that developmentally, there would be no um, way to judge why should a 30-year-old man, man act differently to a three-year-old kid in the same way. So that's common sense. So recovery, for me, the important thing is, is how your fellowship expands. So initially, it's just me as a urine addict and my urine addict buddies, then all addicts. And there's a certain stage where it needs to break out of that ethnocentric <clears throat> sort of, I only connect with addicts, to I connect with other fellowships, you know, whether it's the test club or, or the integral community, whatever. And eventually it becomes broader and broader until your fellowship is, you know, the human race for that matter. Yeah. Uh, yeah years ago, I did a 12 integral steps of recovery. John, John this will be our final comment. We're waiting. Okay. Down. okay good, just... good luck with that. Anyway. Um, and the, the last 12, the, the, the 12 step was about service and, you know, helping other addicts and bringing this truth to, to other alcoholics in the original. And this was just about finding your path of service to the world you know, expanding it into all of creation. And I want to say, if it wasn't for recovery, these three beautiful men that I'm talking to would be probably dead right now. That's so true. it is noble work and so worth it. And I'm so Thank glad you did know, D. 
uh, guy, and that you're here to bless us with yeah. your yeah. your brilliance and your wit and your charm, and your humility and your big heart. And uh, you're kind of we talk about ourselves being the three musketeers in the show. Well, D'Artagnan just showed up. Now <laughs> we've got the fourth musketeer here. So. That's great. Speaking of D'Artagnan, Doug, do you want to make a comment before we wind up here with uh, Guy? Guy, I just uh, want to thank you so much for for being here and really getting into this this has elucidated so much for me and yeah, yeah. you know shined a light on on not only the experience of my past but uh also some of the things that i can continue to look towards and look forward to um in terms of connecting and, and building those relationships and finding meaning as we go forward i have a lot yet to explore in my journey and i thank you for what you bring to this conversation and we're so glad, so glad to be a part of it. So glad to have you here. And so glad you were able to share this with us. Yeah. Thank you, Guy. Thank you, Guy, for joining us. And, and in the spirit of our previous podcast with uh, Colleen Kelly, uh, we, we very well may be inviting you back for further discussion. I realize there's such richness and you've, you're, uh, you've not only plumbed so many depths, but you continue to research this out, including right now in your doctoral research process. It's really illuminating. And it's a singular voice, Guy. There's no one else that's doing this work in quite the vernacular, in quite the perspective you are. So I really honor it. I feel very privileged to have you with us today and be a part of this community with you. Uh, John, I'm right with you. I'm, I'm uh, really grateful to have the four musketeers here together and credit a lot of my recovery and my humanity to what we're creating here together. So guy, many blessings to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank for our having. listeners, really appreciate uh, your listening in. There'll be more to follow with Guy uh, in future podcasts and uh, really appreciate you guys' attention and we'll, we'll be meeting with you. More to follow soon. Thank you all very much for joining us today. God bless everyone. Thank okay. you.